Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to another episode in our beautiful Ramadan series on the topic of the gates of goodness, where we discuss a different issue every night in order to bring ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both in the month of Ramadan and afterwards as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, to accept our deeds in this month, to forgive us for our shortcomings, and to bless the Muslims all over the world to grant relief to all of those who are oppressed. We have with us our blessed guest today, my dear brother Abdullah and my dear brother Idris and my dear brother Ilyas and my dear brother Muhammad. May Allah bless you guys for your time and your, ener your effort and your energy. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we have a very important topic. Mm -hmm. And of course, every night we have an important topic. Yes. But this topic is extremely important because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that nothing will weigh more than this topic on the scale of deeds on the day of resurrection. What is this topic? Manners, good manners. Good manners. Mm -hmm. Of course, you had to have known that. <laughs> good manners, right? Yes. And so good manners, people, they hear it often and then they tune out. Like they stop listening to the rest of it. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the importance of such a thing. It's a grave situation. And so, you know, before we get into the, the traits of good manners, what defines good manners, let us mention three foundational ahadith that every Muslim should know about good manners. Mm -hmm. So the first is the one we just mentioned, reported by Al-Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, the heaviest thing on the scale of deeds are good manners. That should say enough. That should be sufficient for us. That nothing weighs more than your manners on the Day of Judgment. The second hadith that we want to mention is that the Prophet ﷺ was asked about the two things that cause most people to enter Jannah. Mm. And he said, taqwa Allah wa husn al So the God consciousness, the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fear and love of Allah, and good manners. Mm -hmm. This is the second foundational hadith. The third foundational hadith is reported by Bukhari in which the Prophet ﷺ said, the most beloved servants of Allah to Allah are those with the best manners. Mm -hmm. So the most beloved people, the most beloved of the believers are those with the best manners. Sure. These three hadith are a foundation for us and every Muslim should try to act upon these three. Mm -hmm. And there are many others that add on to this topic. So let us start by describing some of the traits of good manners. So the first thing that we can talk about, maybe one of the traits, is hiding the faults of our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Now what is the importance of this in our religion? Hiding the faults of our brothers and sisters? Uh, I believe there's a hadith, <coughs> like um, if you hide them, like Allah will hide your, like you know, like what you've done also, like kind of this. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, like you, you're not, a, you're like you're not, um, I mean, uh, showing this off to other people, like kind of making him like feel bad or all these things. Yeah, that's correct. So basically with uh, hiding the faults, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hide your faults, He'll conceal your faults. And exposing people on the other hand will also cause your uh, sins and your flaws to be exposed. Mm -hmm. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that. So what do we do if we know someone is doing something wrong? Like a friend of ours, a community member, a stranger, um, a public figure. So what are the limits of hiding the faults? Where, what, what, what do we do with this topic? Because a lot of times we hear people, and maybe we fall into it sometimes, mm -hmm. talking <coughs> about the faults or flaws or shortcomings of others. So what can we do about this issue? I think it depends on the, the gravity of what the person's doing. Um, if it's uh, something small and in insignificant, depends on your relationship with that person. Perhaps you could advise them in privately if it's so small and significant, you could also just ignore it and pretend it's not there, depending on the, the, what's being committed. Mm -hmm. If it's a grave thing, then you don't want to ignore it. You want to ad advise them in private. Right. SubhanAllah. And, so. and, and there's a lot of times in which we fall into this trap without even knowing it, without realizing it. You know, somebody does something or a group of people do something and we start talking about it. We don't realize we're, we're discussing now the shortcomings of someone or something. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we have to be very careful with because oftentimes we fall into it without realizing it. And again, you know, we had an entire episode about the tongue and the perils of the tongue. Mm -hmm. This category, this uh, deed falls un under that. It's connected to the tongue. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that. Mm -hmm. The second thing we can mention is another trait of good manners or manners in general is avoiding suspicion, ill mm -hmm. suspicion not to assume of other people. What is the significance of this in our religion? Yeah, I mean, uh, the Prophet ﷺ told us that the Muslim should make 70 excuses for his Muslim brother. And it's really connected because, you know, one time, subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ was walking with his wife, Sophia, mm. and you know, some, of the, some of the companions, they saw him and they didn't know who she was. It was dark. It was yeah. dark, because they, they started, you know, shuffling, <laughs> if you mm. like. They wasn't sure about what the Prophet was doing. 
So the Prophet Sallallahu you know, he, he said, look, this is Sophia bint Hayyay, you know, this is, this is my wife. So, you know, but at the same time, you know, we need to make those kind of excuses also, you know, we need to, when we see our Muslim brothers or Muslim sisters doing something wrong, something they shouldn't be doing, we need to ascertain whether they know it's wrong, because sometimes people make mistakes they, they don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. like, for example, something like backbiting. It, now, for us, it may seem so blatantly obvious, you know, you're not allowed to backbite, but for some people, they don't know what it is, they don't know exactly what it entails. It doesn't need to be something negative, you know, it can be something very very simple. I think Aisha she said that yeah. one of the words of the Prophet was, you short. know, short. And the Prophet said if you were to take this statement and mix it with the ocean, it would ruin it. Pollute it, yeah. Yeah, pollute it. Something very simple like that. Some a lot of people they don't know that. Right. You know, so we need to ascertain whether the Muslim understands whether it's wrong or not. Right. But then after that we need to you know, if they we need to make that excuse is very important. Sometimes making the excuse is actually better for them than actually advising them. Right. Mm. Yeah, I think that's very important. And that's where wisdom and experience comes into yeah, account, yeah. And knowledge yeah. and manners and all of these things. Now, the two of the things you said I just want to add on to them, which is the first, um, I think the seven excuses thing, some people say it's a hadith, some people say it's a statement by one of the Sahaba. Mm. But either way, the scholars say this holds so much uh, importance because what it means is not literally like my dear brother Muhammad did this, so I'm going to write down seven excuses. Yeah. Once I run out, oh, now I can get you. <laughs> no, yeah. it's like seven excuses, meaning just give them yeah, countless give them, excuses. Yeah. And so what this basically means is when you see someone and you can give them the benefit of the doubt, you can interpret it in a good way, then do so. Now, there are there's some issues with this where some people might become naive or they yeah. might ignore the very obvious that's right in front of them. But what we're saying is generally, if you can assume good of something and it's a very possible interpretation, then try to do so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A very realistic interpretation. <laughs> the second thing is, you know, that's interesting. You mentioned the example. We were going to talk about it in which the Prophet ﷺ was walking with uh, his wife and the Sahaba were far away. They hadn't actually said anything at mm. all. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't even want them to assume, so he brought them over and said, I just want you to know. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we will never assume ill yeah. of you. He said, Shaitan is closer to you than your own uh, veins or your blood, yeah. right? Your mm -hmm. jugular vein. Mm -hmm. So the Shaitan is closer to you. So there's two things in this hadith. The first is don't assume of others. But the second is if you can avoid having people assume of you, this is also a good thing. Mm -hmm. So don't give people a reason, a to, reason assume. to assume. Yeah. Exactly. Because this, this is, you know, it plays two roles in our society. <clears throat> so there's an example here. Maybe we can do a small test right now, a small, like a test right here uh, uh, on TV. So the first is if you see, for example, you walk into a room and you see your Muslim brother, uh, as soon as you walk into the room, he shuts the laptop. W what, would we, what would most people assume, honestly? He's watching videos he shouldn't be watching. Look at. Okay, so he's either looking at something he shouldn't be looking at or listening to something he shouldn't be listening to. What else? What are some possible interpretations that we can give to this situation? We well, are supposed to give at least 70, right? Positive or negative? Both. <laughs> Both. Maybe he's doing something like a surprise for okay. that person. Yeah. Know, this always comes up as an interpretation. Yeah. This always comes up as an... I ask this question every time I give a topic about good manners. And almost always, when I go to the positive interpretation, they say, maybe it's a surprise for you. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe, uh, you know, the person walking in was the mom and they're surprising the mom with a gift or something. Allahu alam. Mm. Or their wife or something. So maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's a surprise they're keeping for someone else they don't want you to know about. Maybe it's something they just want to keep private, but it's not haram. Maybe right? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's something good. Them in Allah. Right. Maybe they were giving a, a good private thing. charity. <laughs> Allahu yeah. alam. So there's so many interpretations. In this situation, this is a clear situation in which you can interpret things in both ways. So why should we always jump to the negative? And this happens a lot where people have such a negative lens, such a negative perspective of other people, they're always giving them the worst uh, excuses possible. So they're always assuming the worst of them, right? Yes, exactly. maybe it's why well, was saving energy or something. Saving energy, like yeah. for the laptop? Yeah. Or? <laughs> the laptop, like, just like shut it off. <laughs> Must have been an Apple product. <laughs> uh, okay, come on, it's awesome. <laughs> Okay. So, so ultimately, there's so many possible excuses, right? There's so many possible excuses. In this situation, it wasn't clear cut what mm -hmm. the person was doing. It wasn't clear cut. Now, let's go to another example. You get into the car and your friend is in the car. Let's say you're a parent and your child is driving. Mm -hmm. They're old enough to drive. You get into the car and as soon as you get in the car, they shut the phone. Most parents would assume, like, who are you talking to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, why, why don't you want me to hear who you're speaking to? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you were supposed to still give the, you know, the benefit of the doubt. What are some possible positive interpretations? Maybe I was talking to my dad and uh, telling him we're uh, ma making a surprise for my mom. Maybe. <laughs> saving energy as He's well. always about surprises, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> mashallah. Maybe they just wanted to <laughs> give their attention to the, their parent. Because some, some people consider it rude, 
if you're on the phone yeah in and front of them yeah. right especially parents you especially know, it's kind parents of rude think, to get off the phone well it is yeah. for in some cultures yes. it is kind of like your parents get in the car give them your undivided attention you know, don't if it's not urgent then don't you we know just have talked about the, the, uh, being pi uh, pious or not right. do to, to your parents so and so another interpretation as you were saying is to save energy again because it's, it's, it's an credit. iphone maybe the maybe the, <laughs> uh, the phone just ended maybe the, the phone could yeah, just end yeah the phone could just happen to right. end at that time or maybe the phone call just ended at that time right yeah. Allah Alam, it could be bad, it could be good. We want to assume good. This is what we want to assume because it wasn't clear cut. It wasn't mm -hmm. clear cut. Now again, some people hear this and they're like, why are you giving people so many excuses? Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get taken advantage of or your kids are going to do bad things without you knowing. We're saying if it's not clear cut, if it's a gray, vague area, don't jump to the worst conclusion. As a parent though, this is another issue. <coughs> if you want, you can verify, you can ask, you can check, this is fine. Yes. But don't automatically assume the worst. Because mm -hmm. this will also create distrust between you and other people. Yeah. Where you're always assuming just people are really bad people. And this reflects kind of what's in your heart and your mind. If you think like this of other people, then what would you do basically? So this is in, uh, in regards to assumption. We have an example from Ibn al-Qayyim rahimullah. We'll ask this example, it's a very common one. <coughs> which is, if you're walking and you see your Muslim brother, and there's alcohol dripping from his beard, what would you assume? Most people are going to assume this person was drinking, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's dripping from his beard. Well, exactly. What other assumption could there be? But what, what is the assumption that he tells us we should have? Ibn al-Qayyim says, assume that someone, he got into an argument with, with uh, somebody who drinks or a kafir, and somebody threw it at him. Yeah. Somebody just threw it at him, it was still dripping from his beard. And so when you came upon him, it was dripping from his beard, you could have assumed that somebody threw it at him. Don't assume he was drinking. You didn't see him in the act of drinking, right? Yes. So again, it's not a clear-cut situation. Another example that he gave is, if, what if you're walking and you hear somebody say, I'm your God, ana rabbukum. He's reading the Quran. Well, He's reading the Quran, Quran, right? Yeah. He's reciting Quran. Somebody yeah. else might be like, whoa, kafir, poor, and they might like shoot him or something. <laughs> but this is what happens nowadays. Yeah. People jump to the worst conclusions, they don't give any benefit of the doubt, and then they take action too, right? Mm -hmm. So they just do all of these things in one time, and they become the executioner, and everything is like done with. And then they find out, oh, wait, this guy was just reading the Quran. So we have this example of assuming ill of other people. This is a huge part of good manners. This is a big and significant part of good manners. An example of this is a, a sister, her hijab, you know, was kind of like, show, her hair was showing. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, I don't know if this is everywhere, but there's been a trend in recent times for some reason, in which some sisters, uh, you know, find it okay to show their hair while they're wearing the hijab. Mm. This is technically not okay because the hijab should cover the hair. This is part of the awrah. But some sisters do this and maybe they don't know any better. So one sister was at a conference or a convention. There were like 10,000 people in the auditorium. Mm. 10,000 people. And she was up there as a host for the speaker, presenting the speaker. And her hair was showing in this same way. So I told one of the organizers, I said, can you advise that sister after she's done introducing the speaker? Because she's going to come back up at the end of the, the lecture. I said, can you advise her in private when she leaves the stage that her hair is showing? He said, no, no, this is just a trend. A lot of girls do that. I said, I know a lot of girls do that, but maybe she's not doing that. Maybe her hair is just exposed. Mm -hmm. And she would really appreciate it if you told her if this was the case. So he's like, no, I, actually, that's really, it's awkward. I can't go tell a sister that. I said, well, find somebody to tell her because there's 10,000 people here. And, you know, maybe she'll, she'll feel like really appreciative if somebody uh, exactly. pointed this out to her. So he's like, you know what, fine. So they went, like, he went to the volunteer's room in the back. And he told her. And then he came back. He's like, wow. I said, what? He said, she was shocked. She almost cried. She's like, I wish somebody told me before I went on stage. Mm -hmm. She's like, I've never, I would never put my, you know, I would never do that in my life. So I said, don't always assume, you know, the worst of people that she's exactly. doing this to show mm -hmm. off or for fashion or whatever. Sometimes people don't know. Their, their circumstances are so severe and so great. Yeah, exactly. And that's why every time we pass by someone in the street and you think you're going to assume bad of them based on what you see, give them excuses. There are probably so many circumstances in their yes. lives. We really don't know the story of everyone that we see. Everyone is going through hardships and problems. An example of this was somebody on a train um, where he saw like a young boy, like five or six. He's looking out the window and he's telling his dad, you know, Baba, look, a tree. Oh, look, the clouds look like at very obvious things. So one guy sitting nearby gets very annoyed. He says, what's wrong with your son? Is he like slow? Is there something wrong with him? Mm. He says, my son was born blind and he just came back from a surgery. Mm -hmm. This is the first time he sees in his life. Yes. He's heard of trees and clouds and, and birds. He's never seen them before. Sure. That man was torn. He felt like horrible because you just assume that you know somebody else's story, somebody else's circumstances. So as you said, always give people the benefit of the doubt, always assume that there's a story behind it and that you don't really know what's best, mm -hmm. that you don't really ultimately know what's best. And you know, the issue of parenting, some parents get upset. They say, you know, I see my children, you know, they're on their smartphones and they're smiling like something is going on, right? What do parents usually think? 
talking to opposite sex or right so yeah. they're talking to somebody of the opposite gender maybe there's a relationship maybe not but they assume something's going on like why are you laughing this much why are you always on your phone you know mm -hmm. what's going on so sometimes parents do assume and again we're not going to get into parenting because that's a whole other topic but the issue here is that you don't want to be naive so that your kids are getting away with things but you also don't want to create distrust and always assume ill of them you want to try to give them the benefit of the doubt verify just ask and so sometimes all it takes is to ask and, and the situation is alleviated. Mm -hmm. subhanallah and so we uh, we want to say this is an issue where another perspective of assuming ill is what about people who look at others and they see their outward actions religiously are you know maybe lacking are they allowed to assume that this person is worse than them oh, no mm, no not at all what does this uh, basically fall under what is this defined as this is a bit of arrogance you know yes. this is and uh, sometimes this is a big problem that we have is that um, we look at someone and we judge people's Islam, if you like, based, we shouldn't be judging anyone's Islam, right. we need to focus on ourselves, but sometimes we judge people based on their parents. And I remember when I was in, in the UK, and um, our Imam of the local community, he said that he saw uh, a sister who had like maybe tight trousers on and uh, like a loose hijab and a shirt. So immediately he thought, no, she's not really strong, if you like, you know. Then one day he went to visit a, a brother in prison and uh, the same lady just managed to be walking past and the brother in the prison said you know what subhanallah this woman she makes sure that all of the muslim prisoners in this particular prison gets their quran um, gets their uh, arabic language books and just other small little booklets for them to help and she writes to them telling them to be strong and and these kind of things and um the imam was he's like subhanallah like, i looked at this, i looked down at this woman but you know what she's doing a deed that I'm not doing. Subhanallah. You know, and it's, it's happened to me before as well. When I was in, um, I was in South Africa for a short period of time, and I thought the same thing. But then, just seeing that the drive, and the um, the enthusiasm, and the deeds that some of the people are doing, some people are like, you know, I've given charity. I've been to help out Muslims in Bosnia, in uh, Chechnya, and I've given charity. And it wasn't boasting, but they were just discussing experiences, and I was there sitting down thinking. Oh, I can't contribute to the conversation because I have I hadn't done what they had done. You know, so we really cannot look at the deeds that other people are doing, and or the, the way that other people look, because you know the Prophet Sallam told us that Allah doesn't look at how you look, mm. but He looks at you know your deeds and your actions. So exactly. we can't look at people and say, oh, this person's a sinner, this person's righteous, and you know these things because, you know. It, it, our day-to-day -day lives, if we're really taking heed of what's going on around us, it really shows us, really shows us different. You know, if we go for maybe Fajr in the morning, a lot of the time people don't have phobes and bids, but we assume that this is what has to right. be, you know, you have to, you look religious in this, but it's not always the case, you know, so we really need to balance it out. And mm. SubhanAllah, Jazakallah, those are very good examples, and I, uh, I know there's a lot of other examples like this. Uh, basically, we're, we're not supposed to look down on others, and so this is a question that will come up before I get to you. This is, this is a very common question in our times. So a lot of people who are really trying to be firm in the religion, they'll say, you know what, you're always telling us not to judge people, you're telling us not to point out people's faults, you're telling us not to, so what's left? You know, we're just going to all have like a you know, politically correct world where everyone just does what they want yeah. and is accepted for what they want. So what is the response to this? I mean, for me personally, it would be first and foremost, you need to look at yourself because right. you're going to be raised by yourself. You're not gonna, I'm not going to be asked about Suleiman or Idris or any of the other guests, you know, Muhammad Abdullah. I'm not going to, I'm going to ask about myself. And the second point, it goes back to what we said earlier on about advising people. Right. And the main point of advice is for the other person to accept it. Mm -hmm. right. And that's a big point because I can't just say, Akhi, you're haram. Like. No. And so this is the difference between judging and advising. And advising mm -hmm. right? So we yeah. see people doing things that are wrong. It's okay to advise. As long as the advice is given correctly. Yeah. And as long as our intentions are sincere. Correct, and yeah. as long as you know, there's an etiquette like privacy and things like this. Mm -hmm. And it's genuine. And you, don't, you shouldn't really care whether they take it or not because it's not for you. It's for them and it's for the sake of Allah. Right? So this, this is the difference between uh, judging people and advising people. A lot of times, a lot of youth who become very religious in the very beginning, uh, they just become very harsh, right? Yeah. They have like this phase where they go through, a, and some of them last for the rest of their lives through it. Some of them five years, some of them one, two years. Yeah, some of them burn out. Burn out, yeah. And a lot, I've seen so many people who did this, and they burnt out, and they stopped praying. They stopped doing everything. And the Prophet ﷺ told us about this, yeah. that this kind of extremism will cause you to wear out. Mm. And so don't, as the Prophet ﷺ said, beware of suspicion, for suspicion is the worst of false tales. Mm. It's the worst. 
And the second thing is he said, do not uh, look for one another's faults. Don't look for other mm. people's faults. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmahullah used to say, the soul that is distracted with itself will always be, uh, will never pay attention to other people. Mm. So you're focused on your shortcomings, you don't notice other people. Even if you did notice other people, advise them, but focus on your shortcomings. Yeah. Don't keep looking for other people's faults. This is a <coughs> huge issue we have. And then even in that case, he said, then the soul that is distracted with Allah is too busy to focus on itself. Meaning it's so busy pleasing Allah, it's not even focusing on his desires. Now another example of this is there was a da'i, a famous da'i, everyone knows him. I don't want to mention his name. He was traveling by plane and they saw a woman who wasn't wearing a scarf and she looked like she wasn't religious. Um, but she was speaking Arabic, so they assumed she was Muslim, but she's just not practicing. They said suddenly, like out of nowhere, she took out her hijab, she started to pray. And they're like, whoa, we didn't even notice it was time for salah, for like an hour. They said, this woman, they, we just, it blew our minds how... We, uh, we assumed of her and then she turned out to do something very, very, very important without us even noticing. And even a few days ago, I was telling my brother Idris how I was walking um, and basically somebody just came and picked me up. And as soon as they came and picked me up, I needed a ride. And SubhanAllah, they came at the perfect time. As soon as they picked me up, before I got into the car, I said, man, mashallah, this person is amazing for this good deed, like they're good manners. They didn't have to pick me up. They, most people just drove by, right? I get in the car, the person is listening to music, he doesn't have a beard, he doesn't seem religious, whatever it may be. But this person just did a deed that most people didn't do. Indeed. And some of the people that passed by had beards and had a thobe and all that. It doesn't mean everything. Now we're not discrediting the things that are important, which is the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. These things yeah. are important. But what we're saying is don't judge and don't assume. Don't judge and don't assume this causes so many problems for us. And it causes divisions in the ummah as well. Yeah. Where we think we're better than other people because of it. Hold yeah. I just wanted to point out how some people confuse, you know, the statement of, um, of Omar ibn Khattab, where he says that, you know, uh, people are judged by their actions because after the Rasulullah's death, we don't have wahi to judge people. No. They, they confuse this in the concept of what we're talking about. And, right. And, if, and, and, and the people use it to, uh, in the wrong way to yeah. judge people. It, I, he didn't mean in the, in the sense of like going around and, and pick, nitpicking on people and saying this. He meant it in the sense of that you're being held accountable for your actions. So whether or not your heart is that way or not, it's between you and Allah. Right. But you will be held accountable for your actions. Right. And, and, and there's many mm -hmm. examples of this, subhanAllah, many quotes that are taken from the Sahab and ta Tabi'een in which people, they misinterpret them. I and this is a problem that yes. we have. This is due to lack of knowledge. And this is knowledge in many areas, not just understanding that statement, the tafsir mm -hmm. or the sharaf or whatever, of the hadith or that incident. It's also just a lack of general Islamic knowledge, really not mm -hmm. understanding. Sometimes it's as simple as a, a translation. Some youth mm. will take something in a different language, like mo most of the, the people who are extreme in our times who basically are making every Muslim a kafir. Yeah. They're taking things that are very, 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 very misunderstood. And this is due to ignorance, lack of knowledge. Knowledge dispels everything. Knowledge is very powerful. Because once a person reaches a, a level of knowledge, you'll notice they, they also have reached a level of humility and understanding mm. and mm. wisdom. And so there's a difference between just having knowledge and having knowledge with wisdom. Right? Mm -hmm. So having the correct understanding mm -hmm. of the deen, like the fahm that is, that is correct, this is <coughs> something that is very rare in our times. It's something that we're, we're trying to educate ourselves about and to spread to our youth, especially those who are you know, taking things in the wrong way. So again, this is the issue of assuming ill of other people. We want to add one thing to this. The example of the hadith that we all know of, of the man of Jannah, right? That man of Jannah, w w when we mentioned his story before, basically, he entered the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ said, a man of paradise will enter upon you three days in a row. Right? Mm. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As goes to his house, he stays for three nights and three days. <coughs> he doesn't see anything extraordinary. Does he pray all night? No. The man did not pray all night. He didn't even pray at night. He prayed Rasha and he prayed his witan maybe and that's it. He woke up for Fajr as Abdullah said. Did he fast or do anything special during the day? Did he go out and give charity? Abdullah didn't notice any of that. Maybe he does do that. Allahu Alam. But the only thing that that man could understand after those three days, the only reason that the Prophet ﷺ said he was a man of Jannah was because of something internal. Mm -hmm. So he was clearing his heart every night before he slept from any ill grudges or feelings towards other, any ill assumptions towards exactly. other. And so subhanAllah, this is an internal thing. You can't assume that you're better than someone because of their actions. Shaykh, if you just like walk um, like in the street, or, like I don't know with your friends, like with your family or anything, like just like look at people, like say like this is a bad person because he's doing this, look at them, like assuming like you know bad people like all the time, you'll have this kind of negative energy. No. When you have negative energy, you're filling yourself with negative energy, so it'll be like not sad, not, you'll be not happy, you'll be like kind of a sad or like kind of down, like kind of negative all the time, like yeah. frowning and stuff like this. Yes, if you just like assume like kind of good in everyone, seriously, like psychologically, you'll be like so happy. For, for two things, first of all, like you don't kind of 
care about what people like doing around you and not judging. So like kind of you live just in peace. The second thing, like if something happened to you by chance, if you're just walking in the street, like kind of your shirt got cut or like out of something happened, like you walking like in, and something happened out of all of a sudden, you're not kind of feeling guilty or feeling bad of what people like will say about you. So like, this is a kind of the, the society we need, so kind cool. of what a good, good assumption and kind of harmony. And everyone is like kind of taking like having excuses for each other. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly. very beautiful. We're going to go to our Ramadan report, inshallah ta'ala. When we come back, we're going to continue discussing some very interesting aspects of good manners. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us good manners in all of its forms. We'll be right back, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Ramadan in Pakistan. Islam is the official religion of Pakistan, with 97% of its 190 million people being Muslims. Christians, Hindus, and other faiths make up the remaining 3% of the Pakistani population. The great blessings of Ramadan are apparently visible everywhere throughout the country. Pakistani Muslim women are very modest in general, but their modesty and love for Islam increase during the month of Ramadan. One of the unique examples of the modesty of Pakistani women during Ramadan is the covering of their heads. A Pakistani woman, when she hears the call to prayer, if she is not covered, will rush to cover her head with a modest Islamic covering. Pakistani Muslims are very close together, especially during this great month. With regard to eating breakfast and the night meal, Pakistani Muslims enjoy eating together with their families. There are many Islamic organizations in Pakistan that care for the affairs of Muslims throughout the country. These charitable organizations provide food free of charge for the poor, the needy, as well as students throughout the month of Ramadan in various mosques. There are also venues set up expressly for this purpose of freely distributing food to the needy and to students. These charitable organizations also sponsor Islamic schools, the majority of the students being from poor families. Some families in Pakistan do not prepare food at home during the month of Ramadan. They prefer buying well-prepared food from restaurants and taking it home. For this reason, before sunset, the markets are heavily trafficked by people going to buy food to provide for their family's iftar meal. The time designated for breaking the fast in Pakistan usually does not exceed five minutes, as Muslims in this great country normally drink water, milk, or juice with a light food, then hasten to the mosque to perform the Maghrib sunset prayer. It's also very common for Pakistani Muslims to eat a heavy meal after the Tarawiyah prayer. Pakistani Muslims are well respected for their great efforts to spread Islam in Western societies and throughout all the world uh, through the translation of the meanings of the glorious Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the Pakistani Muslims and the various Muslim Islamic organizations to guide them along the straight path. The night of power in Pakistan is observed on the 27th Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back from the Ramadan report. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our brothers and sisters all around the world to accept from us and to grant relief to all of those who are oppressed. Before the break, we were talking about some of the etiquettes of good manners, some of the different issues of good manners, mm -hmm. and we discussed how assuming ill of other people is one of the worst things possible. And this is a huge part of good manners. So let us move on now to the issue of anger. Mm -hmm. What can we say about anger in Islam? Abdullah? There's like a clear hadith, like, you know, la ta'bab, like, you know, don't be angry. What was the, wh when did the Prophet Sallallahu say that? What was the reason, the context? Uh, he asked them about, what, tell me something that, that, that I can benefit. The, the, give, give me the advice. The advice. He told them, don't become angry. Mm -hmm. Of course, we w he, he didn't mean you, you, you won't become angry. He's telling him to control your anger. 
Mm-hmm. Controlling your anger is, is, is an act of, of a person of jinnah. Le- learning how to control your anger. And he actually repeated oh, so he it three times, right? Say, oh, advise me. Faradda da miraran qala la taqdab. So he mm-hmm. so said like, again and again, advise me, advise me. And Prophet said, don't become uh, angry. You know, and um, it's very important because sometimes when we become angry, we, we do things that are just blatantly wrong. And we know, we, we know it's wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very important, you know, like, Controlling our anger is actually, the Prophet told us that a sign of strength isn't the one who can you know, wrestle people or you know, yeah. overcome people. Yeah, let, well, before we get to that, I'm going to get to the hadith. That's a very good, very important hadith. Mm-hmm. So this issue of anger is a part of good manners. A lot of people don't realize this. Yes. So they go do all these good things. They pray, they fast, they pray, they donate in charity. They have, you know, whatever the relationship with their family is taken care of, their parents. But then when it comes to their temper, they lose it very easily. Mm-hmm. It, they, don't, they don't control it. They don't tame it. They just... They just unleash. <coughs> and the problem with this is that it causes so much damage in people's lives. So much harm in the world is because of unleashed anger, right? Mm, exactly. It causes problems between uh, spouses, right? Divorce all the time mm-hmm. when anger, right? Uh, when, when the person is angry. It causes problems between parents and their children. It causes problems between uh, friends, business partners. It causes problems in massage communities, uh, Islamic organizations. Um, it causes people, basically, causes people to lose their minds temporarily. And so some people will look at anger, this is my perspective, as a form of insanity or intoxication. Mm -hmm. Because when you're intoxicated, you're doing things that you don't really know what you're doing Mm -hmm. and that you regret later on. Exactly. And when somebody's angry, they're going to say things that they regret and they're going to do things that they regret if they don't control their anger. So either you control your anger or your anger controls you. There's no other option. When you're in that moment where shaitan is making you angry because of somebody else's statements or actions, you have to really work hard to control yourself. And this is a huge part of good manners. So one thing we want to say about this is the hadith of the, the wrestling incident, right? So the Prophet ﷺ was walking. He saw some people. He said, what is this? They said, this man right here is the strongest. They said, this man, he, he can be anybody. So the Prophet ﷺ said, shall I not tell you about someone who's even stronger? He said, the one who, when he's mistreated by another person, he controls his anger. He has defeated his own devil and the devil of the one who made him angry. And this last part of the hadith is not usually mentioned. But it's important to note because the, the shaitan fuels your anger and they feed off of anger. Mm. And on this note, we want to mention that there are two emotions, two emotions when they're at an extreme, the devils can sense them, the shayateen can sense them and they fuel them, they love them, they come to them. What are these two things? The first is extreme anger and the second? Extreme happiness. No. Fear? Extreme fear. Mm. So they can feed off of fear, extreme fear and extreme anger. Because fear, with the issue of fear, especially when it's extreme, is that you're not really putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. You're always fearing everything and you're not really having tawakkul. And so with fear, they can feed off of that and they can feed off of anger as well. And so when you beat, when you beat uh, yourself, when you control yourself, meaning, then you have, have victory over your own shaitan exactly. and the shaitan of the person who made you angry. So this person is stronger, the Prophet is saying, than the one who's just physically strong. Because mm-hmm. physical strength, some people can attain it, some people cannot. But with mental strength, it takes a lot of effort. It's a real jihad, right? Yeah. That's a real struggle. Mm-hmm. And so what are some of the advices we can give to people in order with regards to anger? Because some people, we've mentioned before, some people want to change. We had an entire episode about change, right? And with change, some people, they are more inclined to something than others. Yeah, maybe some of us are more patient, but some people, they, they, they become angry very easily. Mm-hmm. So for them, it's a bigger struggle. What can we say to them about this issue of anger? I think before mm-hmm. we mention the, the hadith and the steps and things like this, mm-hmm. we should mention that if you have a problem with something, you should seek help for it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Islamically, rather, it's encouraged, you know, such as anger management or books or lectures, whatever it may be, about anger. This is a very important thing if you have a problem with it. And if it's something that's minor, then you should work on it as much as possible. And uh, we should all point out the hadith related to this. So what are the cures for anger from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Wudu. So one of them is wudu. To make wudu is one of the things the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised. What else? If, you, if, if you're standing up, you should sit down. Mm-hmm. If you're okay. sitting down, you should lie down. Lie down. So this hadith is very <coughs> interesting. We're going to get to this in a second. But this is the last one I want to mention. This is, that's number four. So you mentioned wudu. What else? When you're angry. Pray. Prayer wasn't mentioned, but a lot of people make wudu and pray because it makes them feel better and connect to Allah. There's no doubt <coughs> prayer will help you, but it wasn't mentioned specifically for anger. So wudu, Sorry, seeking know. refuge in Allah from the shaitan, right? Yeah. It sounds <laughs> obvious, but a lot of people forget it when they're angry. Yeah. Billahi min shaitan rajim. So you seek refuge in Allah, that's the first thing you should do actually. <laughs> and then the second thing you should do is make wudu. The third thing is to remain completely silent. If you're going to say something, 
uh, if you have to speak or whatever, or you think you're going to act upon it, and you cannot sit down, you cannot go make wudu, just remain silent. Because silence will protect you from that. So silence is one thing that was mentioned. And number four, this is what I want to get to, is that the Prophet ﷺ told us, if you're angry, in the meaning of, if you're angry, and, uh, and you basically want your anger to be dispelled, then sit down. He said, if you're still angry after you sat down, then lie down, like flat. Now a lot of people ask, I've never seen anybody do this. I don't know anybody, I'm saying this myself, I've never seen anybody lie down flat while they're angry. When they're really angry, right? Because they want to move. Unless they're, being, unless they're being held down. <laughs> right, unless they're, being, <laughs> unless they're being held down. I, I've never seen that in my life. Lying down flat, like somebody voluntarily choosing to do so. And yet the Prophet ﷺ told us to do that. This is a sunnah that needs to be revived because a lot of people don't realize. I want to mention one thing about this. This is something amazing. In 2009, there was a study that was conducted uh, in the United States and other places as well, which proved that a part of the brain, you know, there's, there's some parts of the brain that become active when you're angry. They said when you're lying down flat on your back, they noticed when they mapped the brain that the part that wants you to take action and move and do things like throw things or punch someone, they said it wasn't even activated. When you're lying down flat, it does not become active. So you're angry and you can say things and hear things, but you don't feel, your body doesn't feel like taking action. You don't feel like you're going to have to hit someone or do something physically. And it's completely shut off. And it shows us the Prophet ﷺ told us this more than 1400 years ago. We don't need science to tell us what to do. Mm. The Prophet gave us the cures for everything وسلم, And the Quran is a cure for everything And so if we acted upon it We would realize that this is the real strength To follow the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, Would give us real strength in every area of life I was going to say just briefly Adding on to that is that SubhanAllah If you look at when we're angry we do the exact opposite If when we get angry and we're lying down We will get up quickly yeah. And that can lead to you know a, a situation escalating, you know, and like if I'm angry and I get out quickly, he might think, "What?" Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so it's subhanAllah. It just goes to show that you know we follow the advice of the Prophet, and we live much happier lives, no. much happier lives. But sometimes we, sometimes we get bogged down by culture. You know, my my culture says I should do this or I shouldn't do this or I think that this is right or this isn't right. But we just need to try to absorb the advice of the Prophet so in, in, in the best way. Yeah. So with the issue of anger, yeah, Tuna. I just have something to add really quick. I, I can attest to, to, to this hadith being true because I've tried it and done it. Mm -hmm. I've had a temper before at times in the past. And I can attest to you that you feel like a complete idiot if you're lying down and trying to argue with someone. <laughs> you won't. You <laughs> won't true. even... Yeah. It doesn't even work. It doesn't right. register. You just feel stupid. You just want to relax. You don't even want to argue. Even sitting down, you feel stupid. You don't want to argue. You it, the, the, the need to want to argue or be angry leaves you. Mm -hmm. You feel like it, like this is this pointless. So it, believe me, if you it's believe in it and you tr try it, it will work right. for you. This is mm -hmm. absolutely true. Because the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't tell us something so unless Allah had revealed it to him, related yeah. to the religion. And so this is something that's extremely mm -hmm. important to note as a cure for anger. Yeah, One like last thing have, on anger. If you have like a fight with your wife, like keep her like you know sitting down. Everyone um, should just sit, right? Yeah, 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 sitting down. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let us move on now. So this is the issue of anger with regards to good manners. We don't want our anger to take the best of us, to control us, to cause us to regret something. Because exactly. wallahi, thousands of people come to the masajid all the time yes. saying, I did this and this and that. And you ask them, what happened? They said, we st it started angry. with a fight. Mm -hmm. I was angry. I couldn't control myself. Well, this is where you're supposed to control Remember yourself. Remember consequences. Right. So you always think of the consequences. Mm -hmm. And think of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would prefer <coughs> for you to do. And think of what shaitan would prefer you to do. So you have two options. You always have these two options. So try to always follow the advice of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And there's no regret with that, ever. So this is the issue of anger. Moving on, we have the trait of good manners that's related to our speech. We talked about it in depth. We want to mention just one issue which we didn't really get to, which is the issue of profanity. Mm -hmm. The issue of cussing a lot. And so some people cuss very easily. Some people, as soon as they're in a bad situation, something happens to them, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is like a word of profanity, right? So what can we give advice to these people? We just need to remember that, you know, a person could be sent to the fire for a distance of 70 years because of one word that they mentioned and they wasn't really thinking about it. And, you know, when we use bad words, it leads to other bad words. Or when we use good words, it leads to other good words. So, you know, when things become hab habitual, then if we die, then maybe those habits are going to appear. So maybe when a person's dying and they've been using you know, F words and all this kind of no. maybe that's going to come out on their, when they're about right. to die. You know? mm -hmm. So we need to always remember to use bad, because these bad words, they actually promote bad feelings. Right. 
So and bad actions. thoughts. And bad thoughts, you and know. Actions. So the more the more good we speak, then the more hom harmonious the environment oh. around us is going to be. And so it's interesting because what you're just saying, some of the youth came up to me for asking me. They said, "Is there any ayah in the Quran, in the Quran, or a hadith, or anything telling us anything about cussing a lot?" They said, "We didn't ever hear anything. So if you tell us that there's a hadith about it, we'll never cuss again." So I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. I actually found one of the hadith that I had been mentioning for a few years in a lecture about paradise and hellfire. That with one of the descriptions of the people of the hellfire, the Prophet <coughs> ﷺ mentioned some other people at the end of the hadith. It's an authentic hadith in, uh, reported by Imam Muslim. So he mentioned those who lie often and those who use obscene foul language. Mm. And this was a clear cut hadith. And even in the Quran, we have the example of just saying something good, using kind words only. Mm. We have the a, a hadith of saying something good or remaining silent. And we have the hadith, we had an entire topic just about the tongue. Basically, um, one thing that could be so pleasing to Allah will lead you to the highest ranks of Jannah. Exactly. One thing that is so displeasing could lead to a punishment in the lowest uh, depths of the hellfire for 70 years. Or 70 years in the hellfire. Yeah. So, with this issue of, of cussing, you know, we don't want to make it too long, mm -hmm. is that some of the youth, mashallah, they wanted to work together on this. So they said, let's make a pact. Whoever uses a word of profanity has yes. to basically donate. The swear box. Right. So they actually did this. They said after a week or two, they just stopped because it cost them too much money. Yeah. And they became broke. So they just stopped using profanity. And they felt better about it. Because ultimately, think about this. That same tongue that you're saying the name of Allah with, and you're reciting the Quran with, and that tongue that Allah gave you, it's a gift. Some people are not even able to speak. Some people don't even have tongues. So Allah gave you this gift. Use it wisely. Don't allow the tongue that says the name of Allah to say something that's so you know, disgusting. And the second thing is remember that the angels are writing down everything you say. So don't make the angels write down profanity. You don't want to come on the, in Jannah and then meet the angels and then they'll be like, I remember what you, you made me write that one time when you yeah, wrote the, said that smaller. one thing. That's not going to happen, but we're just saying in general. Don't make the angels write down words of profanity. Mm -hmm. And so we ask Allah to protect us from that. Do you want to add something before we... Yeah, well. I was about to yeah. say like not just like you know in the here like in like in life after this like in, in here also like in this world in life your social like uh, like the people around you if you like cuss and like say bad words and stuff like this people like go away from you run away from you why people like you know, love those who like kind of say good words to them like kind of say good things like in, in general the people of good love to hear good exactly and but the people of evil there's unfortunately there are some no, people who don't mind hearing it because they like it themselves they like you yeah. feel like they're saying this like kind of out of I don't know out of shame and like they're saying this like maybe like uh, they say that they think they're cool but believe me Sheikh, between them and themselves like they're not feeling good. And the question we usually ask is, and this is a question I ask myself all the time because it helps with our decision making, mm -hmm. is if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so here, so would I do it? Mm -hmm. Would I say it? Mm -hmm. And Allah is watching me constantly. Allah is watching us constantly. Exactly. So why would you change your actions when your parents are there or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there, but Allah is watching and you're not taking heed of that. So we ask Allah to protect us from that. Mm -hmm. Moving on to another issue of good manners is gossip, right? Talking about other people. One of the tabi'een famously said, if somebody comes to you and says something bad about someone else, then know for sure that this person can easily backbite you. Mm -hmm. If they're backbiting about someone else, they can backbite you very easily. And this is a huge issue of ghiba. It's a very, very big issue. And so when people fall into this issue of ghiba, it's worse than eating the flesh of your, your, your brother or even dead meat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like the example of the donkey, right? The mule. They were walking one day with the Prophet ﷺ and he, told, he even told the Sahaba, why don't you eat from this? So they thought, they weren't sure what he was saying. They said, is it okay for us to eat this, Ya Rasulullah? Like it's a dead corpse of a donkey. Is this okay? He said, this would be better for you than what you did back there. And what had happened was mentioned in the hadith. They were talking about someone who passed away, one of the sahaba who passed away. They said one phrase describing something bad about him. Just one phrase. He said, eating this dead donkey, the flesh of it, is better for you than what you did back there. Oh, wow. It's better for you than what you did back there. Gossip is so severe. So we mentioned before, if someone comes to you with gossip, before they tell you, hey, did you hear about so-and-so, what she did or he did? Ask them, is this something that's verified, first of all? Is it true? Because if it's not true and it's bad, then this is not even a ghiba anymore. This becomes namima. And it's even worse. Because now you're passing on a lie. Second of all, is what you're about to tell me beneficial? If it's not beneficial, then I don't really need to hear it. Exactly. And the third thing, is it good? Is what you're saying about Abdullah or Muhammad or Sara or Maryam, is it something good about them or is it something bad? If they tell you, no, it's not really good, I just want you to know so you're careful or whatever, they come up with a reason to justify it, tell them, no, listen, I don't want to fall into the sin of backbiting, so please don't tell me it. I don't want to deal with this. Hold on. Very quickly, no, go ahead. people don't sometimes understand that even saying something good could be backbiting. If I know that, for instance, that uh, Ilyas does something and, it, and, and, and it's good, but he doesn't want anyone to know. And then I go telling everyone what he did. It's displeasing to him. 
because he doesn't want anyone to know. Yeah. You shouldn't go around saying things that people don't want other people to know, even if it's good. Right. Just respect his wishes, especially when you know that it's something good. Right. It's, that's a very rare circumstance, though. It's, it's usually, rare, but... Yeah, the greater type of backbiting is usually with something that's negative about them. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is something where somebody's trying to hide a good deed. They mm -hmm. don't want people to know about it. You should hide that for them as well. Mm -hmm. Basically, anything that they, don't, they wouldn't want to be said, don't say it about them. Mm -hmm. What if you're in doubt? Then don't say it. Yeah, don't say it. If you're in doubt, like, would you want me to say this or not? Then don't say it, because you're not sure. Would you rather have doubt and fall into a sin? No, you'd rather be on the safe side. And so w one thing that happens often is, well, we, know we sit down and sometimes people start backbiting. Sometimes it could be a family member, it could be our parents, it could be our friends. And sometimes they're, they're doing it intentionally or not. Sometimes they're angry. So sometimes people have different excuses for backbiting. None of them, are, most of them are not justified. Anger is not ju a justification for backbiting. You know when your friend comes to you and says, Oh my God, I'm very angry. This happened to me today. You say, what happened? They start telling you, so-and-so did this and that. You don't that's not an excuse for backbiting. Mm -hmm. The only times, this is very rare, the only times you're allowed to backbite, and it wouldn't be backbiting, is when uh, you're telling somebody about a matter that you need help with, like for a fatwa, and they have to know, maybe there's somebody in your family that's doing something or whatever, abuse or something, and they need to know. That's the only, it's a rare circumstance. Mm -hmm. Another circumstance is when you're dealing with someone for business. So somebody comes and says, can I deal with this person for business? You say, no, I had dealings with them and they stole from me or they, they cheated people. So I, I would not deal with them. Marriage. Uh, yeah, another one is marriage. So this is the one we're going to get to. May Allah grant you a righteous spouse. So, so when somebody has an issue of marriage, they come and ask about so-and-so. You say, tell me everything about him. That's related, that's exactly. important. Now, they're not supposed to mention things of the past either. They're supposed to mention things that are you know, still occurring because people change. People mm -hmm. become better. So gossip is a deep thing. We don't really have time for it because we have to wrap up. But when it comes to gossip and you're sitting there, you have two options. Either you change the subject or, and you tell the people, mm -hmm. you advise them not to backbite, or if you fear physical harm, only fear physical harm or some kind of retribution, then you should leave the gathering. But you should never remain while people are backbiting. Never, because you will be questioned about it on the Day of Judgment. And so this is in a circumstance in which you're able to change the situation and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So as we wrap up, we want to give some action items because we're uh, done with today's episode, mm -hmm. which is the first thing is reflect on the things that you hear that you can relate to more. Because sometimes we hear things they don't relate to us. Some of us don't have anger problems. But reflect on your shortcomings with manners. Where do you fall short? Maybe you have some pride, maybe you have profanity issues. So work on the things that you have a shortcoming with. The second thing is practice, practice, practice. Some people say, I'll never change my behavior. Yes, you can change. It takes a lot of practice, yes, and a lot of effort. But you can absolutely change. Number three is surround yourself with good people because this will affect you. Mm -hmm. Good friends, good family. Don't surround yourself with bad things, bad movies, bad TV shows. They will cause your manners to change. They will cause you to use profanity. And number four is take the advice from other people when you have shortcomings. Umar al Khattab said, may Allah have mercy on a person who shows me my shortcomings. So we ask Allah to allow us to change when we have advice and, uh, from other people, especially when it comes to our shortcomings, whether they give it to us in a good way or not. And the last piece of advice is always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, allow me to change my manners, allow me to become better. Oh Allah, as you have perfected my creation, my khalq, allow me to change my uh, manners, allow me to become better in my manners. This is the dua the Prophet sallallahu used to make. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us good manners in all that we do. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who have good manners as the heaviest thing on the scale of deeds on the day of judgment. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment because of good manners. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward our guests for their time today and to allow you guys to have an immense amount of reward for the time and the effort and the sacrifice that you gave today. Jazakumullah khaira. We will see you in a future episode inshallah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.